Hi, I'm Megan Humphrey, and I am the executive director of HANDS, and our mission is to get food to older, <laughs> uh, older adults who are low income. And today with me is David Hirschberg, and he is a lifelong Burlington resident, and we are going to be speaking with him about his family's role in the food industry in Burlington, of which is a long history. And first we want to acknowledge that Native Americans lived on this land first and others started to settle in Burlington in about the 1700s. So when did any of your family first come to Burlington? My mother came in um, 1898 as an infant from Lithuania. And my dad came as a 16 year old uh, from, from Lithuania also. Uh, and he came in 1912. So they had no connection before? Had no connection at all. And did they initially come right to Burlington or did they stop other places? My mother definitely came here. My dad didn't come through Ellis Island. For some reason, he came through the port of, of Philadelphia. Hmm. But um, I think almost all of the Jewish families in Burlington came from a place called Kovno. Now it's called Kunis. And I think they came because the peddlers that were peddling in New York and both sides of Lake Champlain, they would write back to Lithuania saying, this is such a beautiful place. It reminds you mm -hmm. of Lithuania. The cows look the same, mm -hmm. the water, the green, the pastures, and it's a very free place mm -hmm. and you you can celebrate your religion without any Cossacks coming in mm -hmm. and so that's why almost all of the people the Jewish community at that time came from Lithuania mm -hmm. and, I, and I can certainly understand why people would all begin to settle in one area come from one place I mean that happens with many many immigrant families they end up settling and so your dad um, how did he start in the food business he was not educated he came here at six, 16 and he got a horse and wagon and he was a peddler mm -hmm. and there were a lot of that's how a lot of people that's how a lot of tailors mm -hmm. uh, tin knockers uh, leather people roofers they they did peddling and they walked around the state. My dad had it better than most because most of the peddlers were carrying something on their back. Mm -hmm. He at least had a horse and wagon. Mm -hmm. So he only really worked during the good weather, like from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And then unfortunately, or he, he other than when he was working, he was a gambler. He mm -hmm. he loved high stakes poker. Mm -hmm. So he was almost like they were kind of referred to him sunshine fruit mm -hmm. because you only worked in the good weather right. and and gambled during the bad weather. Because that's the lean time for money coming yeah. in, certainly. Yeah. And it's and we're in Burlington, so that that's a longer season so, too. You know, a typical week for my dad was they'd leave on a Monday. And they'd go up to the islands to South Hero. And in those days, it wasn't paved. He told me it was, a, it was like a muddy road. Right. And they'd have to stay. There were no hotels or motels. And the Jewish peddlers had to stay in, in the barns. Mm -hmm. And that's when he learned poker because they all gambled all night long. And then he'd move on to the, to, what was it, Grand Isle and then North Hero and then and, and he'd wind his way back Friday to be back in time for the Sabbath. Wow. So that's a really big area, because when you were talking about peddling, I was thinking it was much, you know, maybe a few towns around here. It but was, that's a long way. Originally, to go. it was mostly in the islands. Mm -hmm. and, and he lived on St. Louis Street, mm -hmm. and he was just in a rooming house. And my mother's family lived across the street, and he kind of had an eye for my mother. And she said, I'm not marrying a peddler. So it kind of gave him, I don't know how long he peddled, <laughs> but it kind of gave him incentive to sell his horse and wagon and to get a truck and 
he opened up a little warehouse store on the corner of Unisky Avenue and Grant Street. Mm -hmm. I think the Burnell family had a store there mm -hmm. forever. And he didn't like retail. That was too small time for him. So his, his my mother's younger sister and brother kind of ran the store and he became the wholesaler. And that's what, he liked bigger dollars than right. paying five cents for a pound of potatoes or something. Right, and he he probably didn't enjoy being inside a building as much. It right. sounds like he was, right. he you was, know, he wanted he was to be very out personable guy. moving around. So where, what was sold either wholesale, was that all fruits and vegetables or was there yeah, other food? Yeah, it was fruit and vegetables. And so, and where, where I don't know much get, about the store, it's just, right. But just that he, he told me retail was not his thing. Mm -hmm. And so he put them, but it didn't last very long, the retail part of it. The retail, yep. So where did he get fruits and vegetables? I would imagine he would go to, well, mostly he, he would, when he could, he'd always go to the local farmers. Mm -hmm. That's why I get a kick out of them talking about farm to table being this new concept. <laughs> and he always, always supported the local farmers. In fact, even when we had the warehouse uh, in my lifetime, uh, although I never worked with my dad, but he had passed by the time I moved back to Burlington, um, he always used to say to the farmers, I know it's a long winter for you, mm -hmm. so you leave something on the dock, you go in the office and get a check. Mm -hmm. So what would happen is one farmer would say to the others, if you want to get your cash on the barrel head, Louis Hirschberg pays cash. That's who you go so to. So yeah. we were, we always had the best of everything mm -hmm. because they knew they could get paid quickly. Right. So he supported all the, the local farmers like the, the Mazes, the Brigantes, mm -hmm. Cy Tracy. Uh, I was trying to think of the name of a guy at the mouth of the river who had a carrot farm, but I can't remember. But so, mm -hmm. and then he would probably go to one of the local wholesalers like a Champlain Valley or a Vermont fruit, mm -hmm. which was owned by the Fayette family and probably buy. And get to fill in. Fill in, yeah. But he, but he was a wholesale person as he well? He was a wholesale. He would go farm to farm, store to store. Mm -hmm. And then later on, uh, when he had the warehouse, then he started selling restaurants. And uh, in those days, almost all of the restaurants where like he was an immigrant, he came from Lithuania. Most of the restaurants in Burlington were Greek owned. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was what he did. Mm -hmm. So he was providing for the restaurants. Yeah. But then he expanded beyond that too, or your well, family they, did. They, they, he always had a good business, but he had some of the resorts, like he, um, uh, he sold Basin Harbor, mm -hmm. and there was a French school called Eco Champlain, owned by the Chase family. And I think he, he probably played cards with a lot of those owners. He, <laughs> right. met, he met a lot of the big, he hung out with a lot of these rich guys mm -hmm. who owned businesses because he was a very personable guy. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but he ended up, exp you know, anybody, I think the Hotel Vermont was a customer, mm -hmm. uh, all the diners, mm -hmm. restaurants. That's a lot. That's a lot of business. Yeah. And then stores. A, a friend of mine was saying that there were that there was a that your family was also supplying fruits and vegetables for UVM for a while for at least fraternities. Yeah, but yeah, but I don't think that was until I think that that was probably me. I don't know. That was later, right? I don't know if he ever got the University of mm -hmm. Vermont. I don't know or the hospital, but he's. But there were so many, there were, you know, the only really supermarket was Kolodny's. Mm -hmm. And I think there might have been an AMP and maybe a, a, a Grand Union or something. Mm -hmm. But it was, and but every little corner had a rest, had a store. Right. I mean, I think in Winooski, there were so many stores. In fact, he, one of his drivers, he, he turned him into a salesman because he could speak French and most of those owners in Winooski were French speaking. Right. So. <clears throat> and then how did you get involved? Were, was, did you always want to work in that business? No, did not you at all. I was, I, I went to law school mm -hmm. after UVM mm -hmm. and Judy and I moved to New Jersey because that's where she was from. 
and I was working for the Veterans Administration, uh, and we were handling claims. It, we, you'd sit at the table with a, a doctor and a, a business specialist, and you'd rate the veterans, and I was always in trouble because <laughs> my boss was not a nice guy, and he always kept saying, your claims are too high, you got to cut the veteran. I said, that, I'm not going to do, that's not going to happen on my watch. Right, right. So we didn't get along well. And then after a couple of years of battling all the time, uh, I said to Judy, I'd like to move back to Burlington. Wow. And, and I'll always remember what she said. You're my husband. Where you go, I go. Mm -hmm. So we came back mm -hmm. and my brother was less than thrilled because by that time it was just he and my and my mother, mm -hmm. and they didn't have a very big business. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, "I don't think this business is big enough to support to support, to support you, you know, because yeah. uh, by that time I think I had three children. Mm -hmm. So I said, "Well, I'll try to make it help make it bigger." Mm -hmm. And he said, "Oh, Mr. Big Shot, you don't even know a lettuce from from a tomato." <laughs> but but uh, the first day on the job, he gave me a sales pad and said. IBM's been open for two or three years. See, see what you can do. Wow. So they only had, I think, 385 people. The employees there. At, at, at the IBM, and there was no security, there was no fence. I just drove my car around, rang the bell. Two nice gentlemen came to the door, a guy named Hans Mueller, who was the chef, and a guy named Larry Gerlach, who was the director of the food service. Mm -hmm. And he said, where you been? We've been open for three years. And I wow. said, well, our family wasn't very aggressive. It was just my mother and brother, and they were selling who they were selling. But I'm here now, and if you'll give me the opportunity, I think you'll like what we sell because mm -hmm. we have a good product. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, I'm buying from a local company, and I'm not happy with them. And wow. if I give you an order, when would I have it? I said, I'll be backing the truck up. Tomorrow at 6.30, he said, okay, here's a little order, let's oh, see. Wow. So that's what he did, and that's what I did. And he looked at everything, and he said, oh, my God, this stuff is so much better than what we're getting. Mm -hmm. So as IBM grew, so did our company. It mm -hmm. kept getting bigger. Mm -hmm. And then after a couple of years, he, um, they said to me, you know, if we wanted frozen foods, could you help us? I said, for IBM, we'd build a, a freezer. Right. So, and then a little bit later, as they kept growing and we kept producing like we were producing, and they, they, they were really terrific people to do business mm -hmm. with. And all they wanted was good quality. They mm -hmm. never asked you a price. Mm -hmm. And I said, you don't have to worry about that because I'll treat you with respect. Right. And, so and we always gave you. them a good price. Mm -hmm. We always had a great product. And then we started bringing in canned goods for them. We built an addition on the warehouse. Mm -hmm. So then we became a full service house. Mm -hmm. And then we really, really started to grow. And, and I was kind of the rainmaker because I was the outside guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, wherever I went, University of Vermont, the medical center, fancy restaurants, They'd all say to me, well, who's your biggest accountant? I'd say, IBM has been so kind to me. Mm -hmm. And so that's, we just kept growing and growing and growing. Right. And at that time afterwards, I think Champlain Valley became more of a beer distributor. They had, they had Schlitz beer, which was a big beer in the state of Vermont mm -hmm. and the, and the Fayettes kind of got out of the food business. So we really grew. Yeah, and that and left some space for you. Yeah. So where, you must have had a, where, where was the warehouse? Yeah, yeah, well, we, my dad had bought a warehouse, I think it was probably in the late 20s, mm -hmm. down on the corner of King and Battery. Mm -hmm. It had been a railway express garage, mm -hmm. and he bought that, and that's where we had our, so there, all the food companies were right in a row. There was. We were on the corner of, of, of King, King and Battery, and the next building down was the Fayettes, and they were on the corner of Battery and Maple, mm -hmm. and then further down in the rail yards was Champlain Valley. They were on Champlain. So the three major right. wholesalers were all on Spot, Battery Street. Right. And is, 
did some of the food come in by train? Is that why you were located down there? Or well, the Fayette family were really big, and they had a rail line that came right up to their door. Wow! So I think that's probably why they were down there. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to send a truck, or my dad would go down when he was alive three mornings a week to the Manans Market in Albany. Mm -hmm. And he would buy up the load and then the truck would go down and pick it up. And by the time he drove back to Burlington and by the time the truck got there, he probably had most of the load sold to the different mm -hmm. restaurants. Hmm. And so what was, did you have an earliest food memory? Can you remember anything from well, being a kid? I remember when I was a kid, I used to go with my dad to the different farmers to pick up stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, they could always use an extra hand helping deliver uh, or unload the truck when it came in from the market. Mm -hmm. um, and when I had my first jalopy at the age of 16, he had a gas pump down there, so he allowed me to go down and fill up, mm -hmm. fill up the car with gas. So yeah, we would hang out there once in a while. Yep. And so, um, what was I going to something about But my that? older brother loved, he was always, always wanted to be in that business. Mm -hmm. And the younger brother always wanted to be in that. But I had no thought about it at That's all. That's interesting. So did your, was your younger brother ever involved in it? He was when my dad died. Mm -hmm. But he didn't get along with the older brother and nobody else did either. Mm -hmm. So he left. Mm -hmm. He was in Boston. And when I came back, and we started to get really successful. The younger brother called me and said, you think there's room for me to come back? And I said, your family. Right. And my mother said, of course, there's always room. Because mm -hmm. she was, my mother really got involved in the business later on because they needed someone to take care of the books because mm -hmm. my dad, you know, it was his little piggy bank mm -hmm. and a poker player. And it's not a good thing. That's not, yeah. <laughs> so it became, the business became stabilized once my mother got there, hmm. taking care of the of the books and the money, mm -hmm. but my father was pretty devious. He he would sometimes have the wholesalers on the market send my mother dummy bills, wow. and she'd oh. pay the bills and they'd give him the cash. And yep. so he he uh, he had a he had a sickness. I mm -hmm. mean, it was mm -hmm. he loved gambling. Mm -hmm. And, and that's hard on your mom because she's yeah, she's she thinking was a she's a shooter and a plain right. plain gal and and expected you to work hard. Right. I mean, you know, I get a kick out of the teacher saying how hard it is now with the parents always coming in and complaining about you know you're not treating Junior properly. Mm -hmm. In our generation, the teacher was always right. Mm -hmm. So if my mother said, "Don't ever complain," and so. If I misbehaved in school or something, my mother always took the teacher's Teacher part. Teacher's side, so, yep. So it's a little different than it, is, <laughs> yeah. than it is today. So um, when, when you went to a farm to pick up the food, was it packaged already or did you have to clean well, it and I package? I remember Tracy's corn was always in bags. Mm -hmm. The carrot farmer was always in bags uh, and, and the mazes, you know. They would, the Mazas would bring it right to the warehouse. Mm -hmm. They'd bring, Sam Mazza was a very handsome man. He was a wonderful guy. And he would, would bring this, the, the strawberries or whatever mm -hmm. um, right to the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, blueberries were, were an interesting thing. They were, there were no cultivated blueberries in those days. Right. But my dad made a connection with a farmer over in upstate New York a fellow named Louis Joubert, and um, they had blueberries like a couple of months a year. Mm -hmm. And I think we we were the only ones that had this connection. Right. And we had chains from Springfield, Massachusetts, and all these different places mm -hmm. calling and saying, could you bring down a load of, of blueberries right. Right. because it was kind of unique in a mm -hmm. short season. Mm -hmm. So he always, he was a very personable guy and he made these connections. Mm -hmm. And we loved it because a couple of times a year, the farmer uh, had a huge family and they'd bring us over and we'd have like a Sunday dinner that was sumptuous, it mm -hmm. was amazing. Mm -hmm. So those are always fond memories of, of, of these big farms. Mm -hmm. 
and that and that connection with yeah. them. And it then also when we we got to a point where we were too big for the Manans market, mm -hmm. then we started sending a trailer of our own with our own driver, and we got a broker. So mm -hmm. we weren't actually on the market like my dad was. Mm -hmm. We had a broker who was doing the buying for us, mm -hmm. and they'd send it, and our trailer would go down and pick it up. And down to, when you Boston. say down to Boston, yeah. so that really expanded yeah. it. And then sometimes we would, we would bring in a load of potatoes. We would share it with one of the other uh, uh, wholesale distributors. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I was thinking, when you were talking about blueberries, I was wondering if one way to make, to make yourself stand out was to have something different that another wholesaler didn't have. Yeah. But it's also interesting that you would share things because that yeah. also makes sense. Yeah. Well, we were very, very friendly with the Fayette family. They were a wonderful family and, and we were, in fact, when they were going out of business, the brothers went around to the different customers that they had mm -hmm. and they said, you know, the Hirschberg boys are mm -hmm. doing a good job. And after they went out of business, they had, like Freddie Fayette had a big family, I don't know, eight or nine daughters or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. They would come down and buy big boxes of oranges and apples right for the kids, so we were very friendly. Mm -hmm. Not so much with the Champlain Valley family. That was, we were never close with mm -hmm. them. But That was a little more competition. Yeah, well, that was different. Yep. Yeah, that was different. Interesting. Hmm. So when, how old were you when you started working with your family when I you came back? I came again? back in 1962, so I was 30 years old. Mm -hmm. So had you worked when you were younger? When you were a younger kid, were you part we of would, the... You know, I would help sometimes with mm -hmm. deliveries or unloading mm -hmm. trucks. Uh, but the two other brothers that were in the business, when from the time they were young, they always liked hanging out at the mm -hmm. warehouse or mm -hmm. going on the road with some of the salesmen. That was I was too busy playing football and basketball, right. and that wasn't my thing. Right. Hmm. Um... Wait, we've gone we've gone over a lot. And so, what what would a typical day be of yours at work oh. once you started? Or is there no someday, such thing? You no, know, some days we'd go in, like when my younger brother came back. He didn't get along with the older brother, so my mother and I thought it'd be a good idea to keep him on the road. Mm -hmm. So he did amazing. He went up mm -hmm. to Franklin County, mm -hmm. and we had not done anything. And he got a lot of the stores up in Franklin mm -hmm. County. But the most amazing thing was he went up to Stowe. And in those days, nobody was going lodge to lodge to lodge. Right. And Eddie went every single, he knocked on every door. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're going to deliver right to our door? That's amazing. So yeah. that was, and even the service. mountain company, right. he said to him, we'll even, we'll even get our truck close to your lift. So we can put it on the on wow. the oranges and apples mm -hmm. on the chair and take it up to the mountain. Right. So Eddie did an amazing job getting almost every single account on the mountain mm -hmm. road. Because uh, who would say no to that? Exactly. That's a great service. To get a wholesale price. Right, right. Because I think in the old days, there was an IGA store down in the village of mm -hmm. Stowe. And I think before we started knocking on every door, they had to come down to that. That's where they were getting it, yeah. And getting, paying a retail price. Wow. So here Eddie's knocking on every door and we're delivering twice a week, you know, with fruit and produce and frozen foods and right. canned goods. So That's he huge. did it. That's another big market then yeah. for you. So that was a huge market. Mm -hmm. So did you ever look back and say, it was, was there ever regret about coming back and working no, with never. the family business? Never. Well, the relationship with the older brother, he was difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was, I mean, the family would probably still own it. Mm -hmm. And it just got to a point where uh, I said to my mother, you know, this isn't, no matter how much we're doing, uh, it's, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. So the younger brother and I cashed out mm -hmm. and uh, the older brother really couldn't run it without us. Mm -hmm. So nine months later, he sold the business mm -hmm which is now, I mean, the roots of that business are now owned by Cisco because it passed mm -hmm. a few hands. There were two guys that my brother sold it to, and then they sold it to some guy from Maine, 
and unfortunately he got into a horrible car accident mm -hmm. and couldn't run the business and the family were hot dog people and didn't mm -hmm. want to run that. So mm -hmm. I think they sold to Cisco. And I now think, Cisco's the big I think, yeah, big one Cisco around was here. probably the largest food distributor in America, I would think. I don't know. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, because that, that truck is everywhere, and they do yeah. a lot of big... But there are, you know, there are other... But I thought I was out of the... Once we got out of there, we did other things. Mm -hmm. But then I got a call from the guy from Black River Produce that said, they're having trouble breaking into Burlington. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark said, would you come to work for us? Because everywhere we go, they say, you got to call David. <laughs> He's the guy that owns Burlington. Right. So I went to work for my thought would be a year, and it was mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. And they got really, really big, and they just mm -hmm. got bought out. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, I don't, and I think the Cooper family owned, Bob Cooper owned Burlington Food, and they got bought out. Mm -hmm. So I don't think any... Local people. The original, the original people. Owners, yeah, right, I think. Right, it got too I mean, big. The Fayettes are gone. The Lumbers are gone. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there's nobody. Bob Cooper mm -hmm. is not. He's still alive, but I don't think he owns. He doesn't own the business. So they were all bought by major mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. So when you see these trucks, Performance or right. Cisco or U.S. Food, uh, they're, they're those much aren't bigger. local. Right. And it's interesting because I've heard you say that your dad didn't know how to read and write at the That's beginning, right. but then he ended up op owning this very he large. Had a, he business. could multiply things. He was really a smart guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think if he would have had an education, he probably wouldn't have gone into the food right, business. Right. But uh, you no, know, he couldn't. Yeah, he came here at sixteen, didn't have any schooling, mm -hmm. but he was he was a hard worker. And he a worked smart really guy. hard to make yeah. that happen yeah. for sure. Which yeah. is which is a story for many people who yeah. came came to America. And for our family, and for me in particular, I had a nice place to come back to. Mm -hmm. Right. Living in New Jersey wasn't my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. went there because Judy's family was really close, and mm -hmm. she wanted to, you know, and it was fine. Yep. But um, she loves Burlington, and mm -hmm. and she had a great career at the University of Vermont. Right. And she's been one of the stalwarts of our synagogue mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's been a great... We're glad you came back. I, I am too. And the reason we're still in our house is that the kids keep saying, you're not going to sell the house, are you, Grampy? Well, right. we probably should have sold that long ago, but <laughs> we're, we're where we are, and that's where, right. that's where we'll end up. That's but, great. But thank God during the COVID we weren't in a retirement home. Right, that right. Wasn't, no, that's good. I'm glad you were at your home. Yeah. Thank so, you so much. This was really, really interesting, a, and I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, it. and the people in Burlington have been wonderful to our family. Mm -hmm. But IBM is really has was the key for me right, personally, right. because they they opened up every door mm -hmm. because people had such respect. Right. And um, so the university was terrific to us. The medical center, mm -hmm. all the fancy restaurants. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's great. We had a good run. Well, it's good, and you earned that reputation. Well, so thank you. That's I, good. It was, uh, I never felt like I had customers. Mm -hmm. I always felt that they were friends, mm -hmm. and that's that's the way it worked out. Right. I mean, we had so many Asian restaurants because one of the restaurants taught me phonetically mm -hmm. how to count to 20, mm -hmm. and I had a list of about 20. Mm -hmm. And so every time a new Asian restaurant would come in, they'd say, if you go to David, right. He can speak Chinese. Well, I he'll couldn't know. speak Chinese, right. but they would they would like their orders to be called mm -hmm. in at ten o'clock at night. And then they'd play mahjong all night long. Mm -hmm. So Judy is saying, "Here you struggled in college in Spanish, and here you're taking orders <laughs> from Chinese restaurants at ten o'clock." But but um, a price list of something I never needed. It was mm -hmm. just a mm -hmm. thing built on friendship and trust. Right. And so you respect people who respect you, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. so it's, it was a good run. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.